Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Bobby Donaldson, Professor of History and Director of the Center for Civil Rights History and Research at the University of South Carolina. We welcome you to tonight's panel entitled Remembering the Freedom Rides. This panel is part of a theme semester on justice sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences. Through a series of courses and programming, students, faculty, and community members are provided opportunities to engage in debate, inquiry, and conversation about issues of justice from multiple academic disciplines. We are grateful for the college's support for tonight's program. And we are grateful to our panelists, Charles Person, David Dennis, and Joan Browning. We're eager for you to participate in our discussion tonight. If you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit a question through the Q&A box on your screen. If you're joining us on Facebook, you can submit your question as a comment on the broadcast. In May of 1961, in a campaign organized by CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, an interracial group of 13 men and women departed from Washington, D.C. on what they called a freedom ride. Their goal was to challenge segregation on interstate buses, recently ruled unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court in the case of Boynton versus Virginia. They undertook these rides with no small amount of courage, facing harassment, arrests, and numerous violent encounters. In fact, the first violent backlash they experienced was right here in South Carolina, in the town of Rock Hill, where passengers were attacked and beaten, including Congressman John Lewis. The first ride prompted other freedom rides that continued throughout the South through the rest of the year. Like the first participants, those riders bravely met backlash, arrest, and attacks. At the Center for Civil Rights History and Research, we seek to document, preserve, and share the history of the civil rights movement, including campaigns such as the Freedom Rides. We do this through the acquisition and study of archival collections, such as the papers of James T. McCain, housed in our South Carolina Special Collections Library. McCain, a native of Sumter and a field secretary of CORE, joined Claflin College graduate Thomas Gaither and others in organizing the logistics of the Freedom Rides as participants traveled from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. In the McCain papers, we have an extraordinary collection of date books where he chronicled daily events throughout his career in the civil rights struggle. This page from the May 1961 date book shows the Freedom Riders traveling through South Carolina. We also document and share this history by listening directly to those who lived it. And that is why we're honored to host our three panelists this evening who all participated in the 1961 Freedom Rides. As an 18 year old Morehouse College student from Atlanta, our first panelist, Charles Person, joined the initial Freedom Ride that departed from Washington, D.C. He was the youngest member of that cohort. Person and other Freedom Riders traveled through South Carolina. They stopped in Rock Hill, and then they journeyed to Columbia, where they stopped at the Trailways bus station on May 11, 1961. On the same day, the Freedom Riders traveled to Sumter, South Carolina, where students from Morris College volunteered to join. After traveling through Georgia and after being attacked in Anniston, Alabama, Mr. Person and other Freedom Riders were beaten in Birmingham by a mob while they attempted to enter a whites only waiting room. Following the Freedom Rides, Mr. Person went on to a 20 year career in the Marine Corps, including nine months in Vietnam. Mr. Person's memoir, The Buses Are Coming, will be released in April, 2021. Our next panelist, David Dennis, a native of Omega, Louisiana, and a student at Dillard University, joined the Freedom Rides as a college freshman 
traveling from Montgomery, Alabama to Jackson, Mississippi, where he faced arrest. After the Freedom Rides, Mr. Dennis continued his civil rights work as an assistant program director for the Council of Federated Organizations and as CORE's Mississippi project director during the 1964 Freedom Summer. He later served as CORE's Southern Regional Field Director. After completing law school at the University of Michigan, Mr. Dennis established a law firm in Lafayette, Louisiana. Working with his longtime friend, Bob Moses, Dennis, now a resident of South Carolina, serves as the director of the Southern Initiative of the Algebra Project. His memoir, The Movement Made Us, will be released next year. Our final panelist is Joan Browning. As a student at the Georgia State College for Women, Browning joined the Albany, Georgia Freedom Ride that traveled from Atlanta to Albany on the Central Georgia Railroad. When Browning and other riders, including James Foreman and Casey and Tom Hayden, arrived in Albany in December of 1961, they were arrested. Their arrival and arrests sparked a wave of mass meetings and demonstrations in Albany. Browning's autobiographical writings include an article published in the Journal of Women's History entitled Invisible Revolutionaries, White Women and Civil Rights Movement Historiography, and an essay entitled Shiloh Witness, published in the volume Deep in Our Hearts, Nine White Women in the Freedom Movement. Her papers, which chronicle much of this history, are housed in the archives of Emory University. This is a timely and necessary discussion. As young people across the country demonstrate against police violence and systemic racism in the wake of the killing of a growing and tragic list of African-Americans, it is more important than ever for us to listen to and learn from youth activists of the past who believed in freedom, who fought injustice in this nation and who dared to believe that change was possible. So on behalf of the Center for Civil Rights History and the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina, thank you for being with us this evening as we join our guest in remembering the Freedom Rides of 1961. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Bobby Donaldson, Professor of History and Director of the Center for Civil Rights History and Research at the University of South Carolina. On behalf of our College of Arts and Sciences and the Columbia SC63 Our Story Matters Project, we are delighted to have all of you with us today and very honored uh, to have our distinguished group of panelists. Again, for those of you who wish to offer comments or questions, uh, feel free uh, in the uh, Zoom webinar to offer comments in the Q&A section, or also to offer comments on the Facebook Live broadcast. So tonight, we are fortunate and privileged to have with us three Freedom Riders from May of 1961. Uh, they've come together to have a virtual reunion of sorts about what transpired in this nation 59 years ago and what lessons there are for us to take from that transformative moment uh, in our nation's history. We're joined this evening by Charles Person, Joan Browning, and David Dennis. 59 years ago, uh, each of you volunteered to join the Freedom Rides. Each of you were already committed to the civil rights struggle. And so as a, an initial question, uh, for our audience who joins us this evening, I would like for each of you to explain when you joined the movement and what compelled you to join the movement. And we'll begin with uh, Charles Person. This is a virtual uh, welcome back to Columbia. Uh, 59 years ago as an 18 year old, on the Freedom Rides, he traveled through this very city. So Mr. Person, I'd like to begin with you to explain how you became involved in the movement and what compelled you to join. Good evening and thanks for having me. Uh, my journey began um, as a senior in high school. Uh, I wanted to be involved in the space program. 
and there were a few universities that offered uh, the kind of degree that I needed. I applied to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and they accepted me. However, the tuition there was $2,000 a year. So I opted to go to Georgia Tech. It had a very good program as well. And the tuition was only $375 um, a semester. However, uh, they declined um, my admission. So I applied to Emory University. I submitted my application on a Monday and I got my rejection back on a Wednesday. And we didn't have express mail in those days. But it shows you how determined they were that they were not going to accept black kids at that particular time. So I eagerly uh, attended Morehouse, and when I arrived there, it was in the midst of the uh, sit-in movement, and the campus was alive with uh, debate and activity, and I just became involved with these young people who were determined to make a difference in the world, and uh, we had a very good organization there. We had submitted our manifesto that told what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. And for the, my freshman year, that was what I wanted to be involved in. I, I mean, uh, we had a lot of dynamic people. Dr. King was in the area. He had carried out sit-ins with us. So it was a, an exciting time to be on campus and an exciting time to be a college student in 1960. It was 1961. Okay. So, Mr. Dennis, in, in your 1965 personnel application for CORE, it's seven pages long that details a long list of activities from 59 to 1965. So given that long uh, chronology of your activities, what compelled you initially to join the freedom movement? Well, <clears throat> actually it was uh, uh, our fate, you might call it F-A-T-E. Uh, I really was wanted, I was the first person in my um, family to graduate from high school. And so when I went to, uh, uh, in fact, is uh, I didn't have any real interest in the large extent is to become involved, directly involved in the sit-in movement. In fact, my, my classmate, one of my best friends at the time was a guy by the name of Hubert Brown. And I graduated from Southern Lab School in Baton Rouge. And uh, who later uh, became uh, H. Rap Brown. And when the students walked out of the Southern University in 1960, uh, he and I went and played basketball and did not join in the march. So I got lucky and I got to a uh, uh, scholarship to go to Dillon University in HBCU in New Orleans. And uh, when I got on campus, uh, just like Charles, there was a lot of activity going on. Rudy Lombard, Aretha Castle, and a group of students from all of the universities uh, had been arrested for sitting in. Uh, I still did not want to be involved. My idea was to go to college and graduate and become a electrical engineer. One day I was walking across the campus and uh, uh, there was a little rally under the flagpole at Dell University. And so there was this uh, lady who was speaking. And as I was walking by, she caught my eye, you know, in the sense that she's a very attractive person by the name of Doris Castle. So I waited after the meeting. I went to talk to her to see if I can get a date. And so she invited me for the first date was, was to go to a meeting, which happens to have been a core meeting held at the Reverend uh, A.L. Davis's church in New Orleans. Is, and one of the people who was at that meeting was none other but Jim McCain that you talked about earlier. And so that was my first date. And so I got involved with the movement. Finally, she talked me into um, uh, going on a, on a sit-in and the picket line pieces, which I did not want to do. Um, my first one uh, involvement of the piece, I got arrested uh, by accident because uh, I went to the wrong door to picket and uh, ended up in jail for about four or five days. And so that was the way I began to get involved in the movement was really, to be honest with you, to, uh, to really chasing after Doris Castle. But one thing is, so that was two different, in my opinion, what's in my head always, have two uh, involvement and in, in engagement in terms of the civil rights movement. One was this physical one, uh, which led me to not only there, but also took me from New Orleans to the, uh, to the Freedom Ride, uh, when I got involved with the Freedom Ride pieces in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, the continuation of that ride. So it was in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, where the, the change from just being physically involved and doing stuff, you might say, is without a real clear understanding of why I was doing it, to a real commitment to the civil rights movement. So we were in this meeting at uh, Reverend, I mean, uh, Dr. Harris's house, who's a dentist there, 
and we were trying to discuss, there was a big discussion with all the leaders of the civil rights movement, uh, Dr. King, uh, Jim Foreman, Farmer and others, and they're discussing about the, uh, uh, whether or not the riot should continue. So there was a group of students out of Nashville led by Diane Nash, which was pushing for us to continue. And there was a group of students and people out of New Orleans led by Oretha Castle. And that group is pushing for the same thing. And so from those two angles, it, it, there was this move for us to continue. I was in this meeting trying to decide whether this is what I wanted to do is. My, my mom didn't even know I was involved in the movement. Mm -hmm. I left school. And so in this meeting, what changed my life was, was this voice. I don't know who said it or about anything, but I heard this voice that said, there's not enough space in this room for both God and fear. And for whatever the reason is, everything began to make sense. And so I just sort of collapsed on me. And so from that point on, it changed from not just being as part of something without clear understanding. I, that, that's when a real commitment merged there. And so that was the discussion there is, we would talk about life, death, and we knew that the, uh, uh, I mean, that, that's what we're facing at this point is. I mean, the kids from uh, Nashville, Tennessee, or Diane Ash, they were writing wills, you know. <laughs> so then the uh, kids from New Orleans, we didn't understand that because we didn't have any, we didn't have enough to, to, to talk about writing a will. <laughs> so we didn't, we weren't part of that discussion. Uh, because all we had to give was love. We had we just had to close on our back. But at any rate is that's when the commitment was that my involvement in the movement got me uh, first going. And from that point on there was no turning back. And uh <clears throat> I made a commitment to of my life uh, to the movement at that time. And we'll, we'll talk much more about that, no turning back in, in a few moments. Mm -hmm. so, so Joan Browning, you're from South Georgia. And of, a, of the 400 Freedom Riders, only four were Southern white women. Explain to those who are joining us tonight, how was it possible that one of the four was young Joan Browning? Well, I, I grew up in a place so small that everybody in like a six mile radius was white. I had very little contact with African Americans. I went to a two room school and uh, I tended to be in trouble if I got bored. And so they would give me things to read. And one of the things they gave me to read that made a difference in my life was this alleged history of Telfair County. And there are two stories in there that have stuck with me all these years. One is about a five-year-old who was out with her family in West Africa hunting guinea eggs, and they were tempted to come on a ship by an offer of some red flaming cloth. And she wound up enslaved in Telfair County. And so uh, I grew up on a farm, and one of my chores was to find broody old hens who had made their nest in the hayloft or in the weeds rather than in the hen house. And one of my jobs was to go find those eggs and bring them in. So I could imagine myself being kidnapped, just out getting broody hen's nest and uh, taken away from my family and never see them again. So I was able to, to uh, imagine myself and her, sh her circumstances. And in fact, I have looked for her ever since and someday I'm gonna find what happened to her. The second thing was that when the state of Georgia decided to hold a convention to decide whether to stay in the Union or join the Confederacy, Telfair County had two delegates and they both voted to stay in the Union. So I got a notion that you don't have to agree with the going uh, uh, thought about here. And uh, since we're in South Carolina virtually, um, there is a South Carolina connection. My family's farm was four miles from the Talmadge plantation, and Mrs. Smith Talmadge was a first cousin to your Strom, Strom Thurmond. And so there was a connection politically as well as blood kin between the two of them, and those were the people. When, when I was in high school, only uh, about 10% of Georgia graduates, high school graduates, went on to college, and uh, then Sputnik went into space. And it occurred to people there might be some smart kids out there who don't have the money to go to college and maybe we can get them, get them in school and we can beat those dreaded old Russians. And I was very good in math and so I got a scholarship to go to Georgia State College for Women. I also wanted to go to Georgia Tech, but uh, they didn't even let white girls come to Georgia Tech. So uh, Charles and I found that we have that, that in common. <clears throat> 
And I was doing well, but the church in Millersville, Georgia, the white Methodist church had about a thousand members and it was frankly turning me off religion. And I got invited to attend uh, Wesley Chapel AME Church, which was much more like my little country churches, and, and I was enjoying uh, worshiping there. The uh, president of the college, Dr. Robert E. Lee, uh, said that he was receiving anonymous telephone calls that were threatening to burn Wesley Chapel Church and to harm the college and to harm me. And uh, so I, I joined the movement trying to figure out when the world's wrong with going to church. I went to uh, uh, a, a Christian student weekend at Payne College, a, a CME uh, college in Augusta, Georgia, your hometown. And uh, there, uh, one of the people on the, on the program was the Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr. And what he was doing that weekend was using the same words and concepts I had learned in my little country Methodist church to describe both the technique and, and the need for uh, nonviolent civil disobedience. The, the uh, uh, students at Payne College had been trying sit-ins for a year and had not succeeded in anything. And so they said, well, if some of you white kids seem interested, why don't you join us? And so we went downtown, uh, we had a picket line and we came back to campus and did a debriefing and they were excited that that went well. And then they said, well, why don't we do a sit-in? And so four of us, two, two from Mercer University and two from Georgia State College for Women, joined the Payne College students on the city in at H.L. Green Drugstore. We agreed that we would do whatever the leader appointed for the day told us to do. So as we were leaving the, the drugstore, uh, Bill Diddley, our Payne College leader, told us, now when you get outside the door, whatever happens, turn right and run. And so we agreed to do that. As we opened the door, a uh, Klansman took a knife and was trying to stab one of the students from Mercer and Bill Diddley jumped in front of the student and got the knife in his chest. <clears throat> he said run and so we turned right and we ran and we could look back and see Bill on the sidewalk, his blood puddling around him. He did survive and we went back to uh, be witnesses of the trial where the judge said, he, uh, oh and they arrested Bill Diddley for carrying a concealed weapon, which was the knife that was sticking in his chest. So we went back to be witnesses at the, at the, at the court case. The judge finally said to Bill, he said, well, you've suffered enough. I'll just, just drop the charges. And to the Klansman, he said, you're just an old blowhard. Go back to South Carolina. He was from across the river <laughs> in South Carolina. Um, and so I had to leave Georgia State College for Women. I went to Atlanta and got a job at Emory University. And I had met Connie Curry in Augusta at the Payne College thing. She was the designated observer for our sit-in. And she introduced me to Julian Bond and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So I worked during the week and uh, I was a good typist. Uh, Julian would write press releases and I'd type them. And uh, these are technology words most of your audience don't understand. Mimeograph them and put them in envelopes and address them to the New York Times and the Washington Post. And the next morning they'd be in those newspapers. So I thought Julian was a real magician. Uh, besides, you know, one of the most handsome people I ever met in my life. I mean, I'm one of the legion that had a crush on Julian. And then uh, when, when the uh, Jim Foreman organized the Albany uh, Freedom Ride. He needed uh, half white and half black, and I had the right color. I'd been trained by Jim Lawson. I had been in sit-ins and whatnot in Atlanta. So I was available. Okay. So we'll, we'll get to that in a, in, a, in a few moments. So Ms. Person, uh, if you could lead us, you're, you're among the original 13 who left uh, Washington on May 4th of 1961. For those who gather uh, this evening, could you explain what was the intent of the Freedom Rides as organized by the Corps? And how did an 18 year old student from Atlanta become part of that original 13? Well, uh, we found out uh, early on that laws were passed and many Southern cities uh, decided they would just ignore them. And, um, after the latest uh, Supreme Court decision, Boynton versus Virginia, uh, uh, they decided that, hey, let's test these rules. Let's get them comply with the rules as they have been, uh, in, uh, been enacted. 
So uh, we were brought to DC for training, advanced training, because Corps knew that we had been trained in nonviolence, but they wanted to make sure that there would be no instance of us retaliating. So we went through three days of intensive uh, training. And the greatest expectation we had out of that training was that they might um, yank us off of school, they might pour condiments on us, they might even spit on us or even put a cigarette out on us. But that was about the extent of the uh, damage that we were anticipated from our uh, adversaries. Uh, as an 18 year old, I, I had been experiencing sit-ins and we had, had been very successful. So uh, the fear factor was not there. You know, we knew what to, uh, hopefully what to anticipate and how to conduct ourselves. Uh, and it was just something that you would want to be a part of because this was beyond, this was not regional. This, uh, this particular demonstration was going to be nationwide. It was going to start in DC and in, in, in New Orleans and hopefully the rever it would reverberate throughout the country. And eventually it did do that. But you know, our expectations were very limited and very small at first, but this thing grew legs as it got further and further south because Rock Hill was the first real instance of, of hey, there are people out there that really hate us who've never seen us before. And when we got to Anderson, it just is a whole new level of violence. And I, I think it's, it's remarkable for all the freedom riders who followed after us because once they so what happened to our group, they knew that something was gonna happen if they were a freedom rider. You're either gonna get beat up, your bus may be burned, or you may be incarcerated. Yet they came and they continued to come. And that was the unique thing about it. These young people knew that they were gonna face some type of violence, yet they continued to come. And that gave us heart because even though we had wanted to continue uh, and we're not, we're not allowed to, uh, it was good to see that there were people out there dedicated enough to make sure that that march, that the demonstration did not end in violence. And they were very successful. So, so right before you came to Columbia, you were in, in Rock Hill. And for those who are listening this evening, could you explain what, what transpired in Rock Hill? You were not on the bus with John Lewis, but you were on another bus. But why was Rock Hill a turning point in the journey of the Freedom Rides? It's a turning point, not only for the freedom of for the country, because when John, John Lewis and, uh, uh, was attacked in, in Rock Hill, uh, you know, the police apparently got there before the beating had stopped. And the policeman asked John, he says, uh, do you want to press charges? And John says, no, uh, we're nonviolent and we are not about punishing people. We're about the system of segregation. And this must have had a dramatic impact on these men because Several years later, when John became a congressperson, uh, this man came up to John and he apologized. And that was the only instance that I know of where someone who had beat a freedom rider or a freedom fighter came up and apologized. So it, like I say, it was not only a current point for us because that was the real, first real violence we had encountered, but also later it brought around this, 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 this revelation that, hey, there is forgiveness and sometimes the people who attack those nonviolent uh, demonstrated because we were nonviolent. I think that would guide to him because you really, you, when you think about it, there's no fun in beating someone who's not fighting back. You know, I mean, John took his, their best punches and they didn't go down. And, that, and that's, that in itself is remarkable. So you go from Rock Hill and you come to Columbia and then you turn back to Sumter. And in Sumter, something else unusual happens. You go to that community and three students from Morris College join the Freedom Rides who were not a part of the original group. How did that come to be? Well, uh, well, you know, John and, and uh, had, had been beaten and he also he was scheduled for an interview. Uh, we had another freedom, uh, freedom Rider that had been arrested at the shoe sign in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. So we were running short on personnel and we were trying to keep our numbers balanced. And it's remarkable, but that the three students we picked up from something, they all felt the brunt of the violence because uh, my seatmate in Anderson was Herman Harris, and he was from there. And Mae Francis was on the bus, and she really, uh, I think, uh, the smoke inhalation really took a toll on her. I think it led to her premature death. And of course, uh, my friend uh, Ivor Moore, uh, he was he was he was a gutsend because you know he was there to try to protect us. And you know, they, we had only known each other about three days, yet we had bonded well enough that they were, we were together. And so you left uh, Sumter and ultimately ended in Anniston. 
Um, you were not on the bus, the famous bus in Anniston that was firebombed, but you do indeed go from Anniston to Birmingham. And for those who gather tonight, what, what transpired in Birmingham uh, and what were your memories of that, that fatal day? Well, they actually started in Anderson. We uh, uh, got to Anderson and uh, we found out from uh, our bus driver that the other bus had been set afire and uh, they were taking our friends to the hospital in Brother Carlos. So, uh, but uh, our bus driver would not proceed to Birmingham until we got in the back and we refused. Eight Klansmen got on our bus and they beat us and physically threw us to the back of the bus. On that bus, they, Dr. Bergman, who was the oldest freedom rider, they stomped him in his chest and they probably would have killed him had his wife not implored. Uh, James Peck was a bleeder and James, uh, uh, you know, they knocked him to the floor of the bus and it, you know, made the bus slippery. So the Klansmen were beating us. We were stumbling over Dr. Bergman. We were slipping on John, James' blood and eventually got us to the back of the bus. Um, what made them so angry was when the white Freedom Riders came to our aid, that really made them angry. And I mean, what violence they had directed toward the black students, I mean, it intensified with the white Freedom Riders. But they physically threw us to the back of the bus, and one eyewitness says they stacked us like pancakes. But they sat there in the middle of the bus, and they, they tormented us all the way into Birmingham. They called us every conceivable name that was not nice. And, uh, you know, and they just threatened us. Um, but when we got to Birmingham, James Peck and I were the designated testers. And when we got there, I know James was bleeding and he was battered, but he wanted to continue. So I said, let's go. So we go into the waiting room and the entire wall of men come, came towards us. Uh, James went down almost immediately. And I guess my being younger, I was able to maintain my balance. Um, uh, there was a guy that hit me on the head uh, with a pipe. And at that particular moment, a picture was taken. And when the flash went off, it startled them and they all looked up and they let me go. And I just walked away. But they attacked the photographer, they beat him up, they destroyed his camera, and they thought they had destroyed all the film, all the film packs. But one picture survived Birmingham, the only one that we know of to this day. And it's a picture of me being beaten. But I walked away from that crowd I walked out to the street and as fate would have it, a city bus came by and I get on the bus and I tell the driver, uh, take me somewhere. And he drove about two blocks and he says, if you go across the tracks, there'll be somewhere there to help you. Well, if you know anything about the South, in those days, black folks always lived across the tracks. So across the tracks, I, I was able to find a, a telephone booth and I had my old trusty dime and I called Reverend Shellsworth and told him what had happened, that I was alone and have, we had been beaten and so forth. So he sent three his deacons there to pick, pick me up. And they saw the blood, they said, well, you need to see a doctor. Well, there were three black doctors in Birmingham and we went to all three and all three refused to treat me. So one of the men says, hey, we've got a nurse in the congregation, maybe she can help you. So they took me back to Reverend Salisbury's church and the nurse, she put a special kind of bandage on my head, which was supposed to pull my scalp together. Now that worked well, but what we didn't know, because I wasn't treated, that particular wound drained to the base of my skull. And after a year or so, I developed a knot about the size of my fist at the base of my skull. And at that time, I wasn't thinking about my mortality, but I was afraid that there may be a knife blade or an ice pick broken off in my skull. But with technology, we realized that through an MRI that there was nothing in there, and I successfully had it removed in 1996 by a great uh, plastic surgeon. And uh, there was residual damage. And I wish I found out last year, but I won't deal with that. I mean, you know, it's, it doesn't bother me. And I think I have most of my cognitive function. So when, I, when it flares up, I'll deal with it. Right. So just to show you, show the, our viewers the trauma and the violence you witnessed and experienced, we want to turn for a moment to a short video from James Peck in 1961 explaining what happened in Birmingham. Charles Person and I were to test the Trailways lunchroom in Birmingham. As we got off the bus, we saw a crowd of men, some of them armed with pipe, waiting along the sidewalk. Just as we got to the lunchroom, a group of them seized us and steered us toward the exit. 
As soon as they got us out of sight of the crowd in the waiting room, six of them started hitting and slugging me. I was soon unconscious. When I came to, I was bleeding badly. So that, that's, a, that's a documentary that was commissioned uh, for CORE by the African Methodist Episcopal Church. i never seen it before. You've never seen it before? I've never seen that interview before. Wow. Well, this, this was a documentary done by the African Methodist Episcopal Church and their social action committee, which in 1961 was chaired by a young minister from Sumter, South Carolina named Frederick Calhoun James who is still quite active and quite alert, living in Columbia at the age of 98 years old. Oh. And he was the one who told us about this particular footage. So that gives, again, a sense of what, what transpired. And as we transition uh, to Dave Dennis, so Dave, you, you, you are clearly watching the news and reading the newspapers, and you saw what happened in Aniston, and you saw what happened in Birmingham, and yet you volunteer to continue the Freedom Rides. Uh, so for our listeners and viewers tonight, explain what motivated you as a young college student to face death and danger to join the movement, to join the Freedom Rides. Yeah, well, first of all, Jerome Smith and, and Julia Ehring, uh, who just passed not too long ago, uh, they were both supposed to be on the original Freedom Ride coming out of Washington, D.C. But we were all in jail uh, just before that uh, in New Orleans, and so they missed the ride. I, I never did intend to be on the ride. In fact, because I didn't intend to be in jail at the time I was in jail. Uh, it was a, uh, uh, but that, that, and so what we, what we, the riders, the original riders were supposed to, we said, was the ride was supposed to end in, in the New Orleans. So we were supposed to be the host uh, group for the coming in. So what happened is a lot of the people who were beaten in Aniston, Alabama, in Birmingham, and in Montgomery, uh, the original riders, uh, they could not find the, uh, any, the real medical uh, help of uh, uh, support in those areas. In New Orleans, there was a black hospital that was connected to Dillard University called Flint Goodrich Hospital, where most of the black doctors could practice in, but they couldn't practice in the white hospitals. So they were uh, making arrangements there. Uh, our job as the core group was, was to be able to be able, uh, set up contact doctors and get some of the doctors in the hospital to be prepared for them as core, made arrangements to get those people from, uh, who were injured in the ride uh, to uh, New Orleans, which was not easy. I mean, they, they had gotten a plane for them and a bomb threat, so they had to cancel the flight. They had to get on another flight to get to them. And so when they came in there, it was really, uh, was, I had seen what would happen on TV, but to watch them bring the people in uh, from the airport and and Jim Peck and, and others, I mean, it was they were just a, a, a bloody mess. And so that, in a sense, is sort of grabbed me, but it didn't grab me in the sense is that I wanted to go on the ride. And so we had to find housing for them. As a, we put most of them up at Xavier University, uh, Dr. Norman Francis who was the dean of students at that time, I think it was, helped us to, and Rudy Lombard, who was a student there, found housing for them at the, at the dormitories at uh, Xavier University. So I went back to campus after they arrived, and so the New Orleans core group was pushing uh, to continue the rides. At this particular time, there's a debate was going on between the elders uh, in the movement and uh, from the, the large of the most of the civil rights group is that Kennedy was asking if there'd be a moratorium on, this, on the freedom rides that they stopped for a while. And so that was, a, uh, the elders were sort of, I think more in, in regards to, to being concerned about the uh, welfare of the young people uh, asking that, you know, that the uh, was more siding with than going along with the moratorium. Uh, the uh, young people, though, especially the group, there were two groups, two dynamic women in the movement. One was Diane Nash out of the Nashville group, and John Lewis and other students who were a, a part of that Nashville group who were demanding and, uh, that the, the riots continue. And they did continue from Anniston to, uh, to Montgomery, and that's where it had stopped at, uh, 
in New Orleans, there was this dynamic person, Oretha Castle, who was the sister of the young lady that I was chasing, Doris Castle. And so she was uh, pushing on that end. Is, uh, she was on the phone with Constable Robert Kennedy and others. And so she called meetings at, the, uh, at her house, which is 917 North Conti Street. And I was still a student at Dillard University. And so when Oretha called, you went. So uh, she called me and asked to <laughs> need me to come over to her house right away. They needed an uh, emergency meeting about the, the, the rides, continue the rides. So I went there to Oretha's houses, and I was not willing to go. Uh, but Doris was there, and she was saying, you should go. If you're going to be a man, <laughs> it's time to stand up and be a man. And so I sort of, sort of was taking that challenge in the senses, and then and not saying no uh, at the time. And so uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I went over that doubt was to see Doris <laughs> to Oretha's house. But also her mother uh, worked at Duke Chase. And so she always had great food there. <laughs> and so I went to, there were two reasons that got me in there. So we ended up, I ended up uh, 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 joining uh, a group of pe students from the young people rather from uh, New Orleans. It was Jerome Smith, Julia Aaron, Doris Castle, uh, Jean Thompson, uh, and myself, uh, five of us. And so we got a train in. So we went into New, uh, to Montgomery, Alabama. We got there on the morning, uh, right after the, the night with the riots where they or the, uh, had the church surrounded at the, at the church there. And so I guess what happened there is to get me there was it was, it was a mixture. Uh, I was emotionally torn uh, with the, what I had seen and listened to the stories and seeing what happened is and understanding what the movement you know, was about and might want to be involved. But at the same time is wanting to graduate because I figured that was my only way out of poverty and whatever. I uh, was going to get an education. First person out of my family to graduate from high school, born and raised on the plantation as a sharecropper's family. So it was, it was a torn piece. But when I went there, so the other piece was I couldn't let Doris shame me like this is because she still had not gone out with me all this time. Uh, so the, so I said, I got be, uh, that my, this whole manhood piece got to me uh, to go. And so that's what part of the, uh, the drove me, got me to go there is. So when I got there to Montgomery, Alabama, it was, it was chaos. I mean, there's a rioting going on, the, the cars being uh, burning and everything else is. And we go, as I told the story earlier, we went to this, uh, we had this great meeting uh, for a day and a half at, uh, um, at Dr. Harris's house. And uh, that voice that I was telling you about as early as is that, you know, there's not enough space uh, in this uh, a room for both God and fear. And so something in that is just sort of, you know, grabbed me and, uh, and uh, uh, being part of the movement. And so one of the things that was very interesting about this is, is that when we, there had been, uh, uh, the FBI had been in, I mean, Kennedy was calling in and that was, the word was out that this bus that we left on this bus, it was not going to get to Jackson, Mississippi. That the bus, there was no way. So at the time that we had the people to volunteer, uh, after that, I heard this voice piece this meeting is I was one of the first ones to volunteer to go and, and I volunteered to go on the first bus to leave Montgomery. So we had to go from the house, there is from the house to get to the bus station, we had to go through a mall, you know, and we'd be taken there by the ministers, Reverend Shellsworth and them, who got us into the bus station, got our tickets and got on the bus. But we had, we had no idea in our heads, at least I know I didn't in the conversation, I was on the same bus with C.T. Vivian and others and Jim Lawson. Uh, we were all prepared to die. We weren't prepared to give our lives, but we were prepared to die. And we thought, we honestly believed that we were not gonna be able to, we we're not gonna make it to Jackson, Mississippi. And so, uh, but at the same time is there was this drive, there was this feeling that, you know, you, you got to do this. I mean, this is, uh, uh, I don't know if we, uh, if any of you un, uh, remember, but when I grew up, I grew up in the, uh, in the uh, church. And so we had what they call the morning bench. And yes. so my grandmother used to take us to these revivals, all right? 
And so I was still in the morning bench and I did that for several years. Every revival, my grandmother had me going and sitting on this morning bench. And I'll be the last one on that morning bench because I didn't move, you know? I mean, I did not go. And so people said to me, why, why, why don't you, what's going on, Sonny? They called me, Sonny, Sonny, you don't, you know? And so my grandmother always say, oh, when it hit him, it's going to hit him, you know? It's, it'll, be, uh, it'll get you, you know, it'll grab you. And so what happened there was sort of similar to that because when I did get religion on that morning bench at that uh, church on, on uh, Saturday, it was a Saturday, it when it hit me, it hit me. I mean, like a ton of bricks. And so in Dr. Harris's house, when it hit me, it just hit me, bam. It was like, you know, it was like no turning, never thought about uh, uh, turning back. And so going on that ride and, and uh, it wasn't about Doris anymore. It wasn't about any individuals anymore. It was just about, you know, a feeling you got to do something. You know? Well, so, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned the, the, the distinction between God and fear. I want to put up a photograph from 61, and you can explain to the viewers, what are we watching? A young Dave Dennis on a bus. W what is happening in this particular image? Oh, okay. This guy who is standing uh, right behind me. Uh, I mean, right in front of it, this cop, this, uh, uh, he had been standing there with his bayonet pointed down, like, you know, I mean, if the bullets had uh, lurch, it was going to hit somebody, you know. And so he and I had gotten into it as I told him, man, you know, you know, he's you know, you know, so been buying his, uh, my own business and stuff like this. So we had a little few words. So he stuck it up. He put it up like this uh, 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 on his head. But he should have, like, sort of like he has it now. In, in his picture, and just as soon as he did that, the bus hit on brakes, and the bayonet stuck right on top of the uh, bus. Boom! And so I am looking at him, saying, "Like, told you so." <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what that was all about. <laughs> so, so J Joan Browning, as all this is happening, you're you're watching what's happening in Anniston and Birmingham and what goes on into Jack Jackson. And many people assumed the, the Freedom Rides come to some abrupt halt in, halt in the summer of 1961. But in December of 1961, you write a letter to a friend that says, nobody knows exactly what will come next. And you're writing after you've come out of jail in Albany, in Albany Georgia. So for our, for our viewers, Remind them of how the movement continued long after the summer of 61, and how is it possible that a J Joan Browning becomes part of the last phase of the Freedom Rides? Well, Robert Kennedy uh, got the Interstate Commerce Commission to say they would take care of segregation in public transportation, and it would go into effect November the 1st. But you know, the first laws out the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act outlawing segregation in transportation was in 1872. And the South had been saying, yeah, you and what army is gonna force us. And so we tested it all over the South on November the 1st. Uh, five foot six of us went to the railway station and trailways and the Greyhound station at midnight, November the 1st, and uh, four were arrested. Bob Zelder, who was white and I, uh, were, our orders were to try to sit with our friends at the uh, lunch counter and go into the wrong rust room, uh, but not to be arrested. So while they were being arrested, he and I were scurrying around in Atlanta at midnight in the back alleys that neither of us had ever been in. And it, it, was, it was really a, an adrenaline rush. Um, and, and this was happening in Jackson and in Albany and uh, in other places. The people in the say the uh, Albany, Georgia had tried six times to desegregate the trailway station there. And they had had Albany State College students and NAACP uh, Youth Council students had been arrested in the effort. And our friend Charles Gerard was there and Charlie Jones and uh, Cordell Reagan. And they said, uh, called the uh, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee office in Atlanta and said, can you all come help us? And so James Foreman, Jim Foreman uh, organized the Albany Freedom Ride. Jim had a sense of history. <clears throat> he, he knew that, that a young man named Mr. Homer Plessy had brought the first uh, segregation in transportation case that resulted in 
separate but equal becoming declared constitutional. And so he said, instead of a bus, why don't we take a train to Albany and in honor of Mr. Plessy? So we took a train. <clears throat> uh, it, it was still the custom. We knew what happened in Anniston. We knew what happened in Birmingham. We knew people were in Parchman Prison on death row. You know, we knew that, that it could be dangerous. And so it was still customary to do your last will and testament. I was country enough, I had to ask, what is that? And when it, uh, I, it was described as, well, in case you don't come back, it says what, who gets your stuff? I looked at my stuff and said, you know, who wants it? <laughs> so instead of uh, uh, writing a last will and testament, the young man I was seeing at uh, Georgia Tech said, let me take you out to dinner before you go on the freedom ride. So I put on my uh, black sheath dress from the yearly new shop and my Woolworths pearls and my high heels. And we went to a new place called Stuffers at the top of Peachtree. Yeah. I don't know how he could afford it. Maybe. Maybe he washed dishes to pay the bill. And I broke the law deliberately for the first time in my life. Uh, after dinner, he said, would you like a brandy? And I asked what that was. And I said, yeah, yeah I can give it a try. And I really did like Benedictinian brandy. And so I sat there at the top of Peachtree breaking the law. When we got to Albany, <clears throat> um, there, there were two things that were different. One is the whole community felt they had invited us. The whole African-American community felt they had invited us. And they were really offended that we were arrested. And so they started marching by the hundreds every day down to the jail, singing outside our jail cells and protesting that, that we had been arrested. And they were arrested. At the end, of, we were arrested on Sunday and by Friday, a thousand people had been arrested. And uh, so they invited Dr. King to come down and help out. And uh, uh, he did, and he was just going to come and give a pep talk and go back to Atlanta, but they uh, kind of bullied him into leading one of the marches, and he was arrested. And so, with all the arrogance of a 19-year-old, when I'm asked if I followed Dr. King to jail, I say, no, I was in jail Sunday, and he didn't get there till Friday, so he followed us to jail. <laughs> But uh, the other thing that was different, I, I was the only white female in jail at that time. And so uh, I wrote to my friend Faye, called the historians call it the Dear Faye letters. Every day, several times a day, what I thought was going on, what I saw was going on. So it was a real, like uh, Mr. McCain's diary, it's a diary of, of what was happening minute by minute as I saw it. And that's a valuable resource for figuring out at least what I thought was happening. But it, all of us in jail were passing notes back and forth to each other. And uh, Lenora Tate collected many of those, some that I wrote to her and many from James Foreman. And her letters from jail are now at Emory too. And so the two collections are there together. <clears throat> I, at the time, they uh, told me that I had caused quote, a hell of a disturbance because the white men wanted to teach me my place and they, they thought I had missed something along the way. And I, I didn't take it seriously at the time, but when I read Lenora's letters and communication between she and Jim Foreman, they really did think I was in some special danger because being a Southern white female, I was only 70 miles from home when I went to jail in Albany. So they couldn't do the old outside agitators thing on me. But, uh, uh, you know, I just sat there at Emory and, and wept that these two wonderful people were so concerned about my safety when I was in jail. Uh, why did I do it? I had never felt so thoroughly in the right place with the right people doing the right thing. You know, that's a, that's a powerful feeling and uh, one that I keep seeking even now. Thank you very much. Um, we have some time, uh, we will turn soon to our, to our audience, but just for the four of you, before we turn there, everything you were doing in 1961 made the headline news. At the time, did you all understand the impact or the consequence of the Freedom Rides or what it really meant for the country? My person, I did not. I, I really definitely did not understand. And when I came out of the 
uh, got out, out of Parchman. I went back to New Orleans and then I went home in Shreveport and I set up a court chapter and I we had, had no income really. And then I had, you know, there were uh, churches were being bombed. I mean, I had this great mentor um, by the name of Dr. Seal Simpkins, who was head of the NAACP. I, I did not understand, but what maybe as, as we uh, began to have the movement and I began to move around and throughout Louisiana and Mississippi when I joined up with Bob Moses and them and uh, uh, headed up the court work in 1962 in the Mississippi. I began to understand it because the people in the communities, if you were part of the civil rights movement and young, they call you a freedom rider. And so as uh, Bob Moses was called a freedom rider, people who had never been on the freedom ride, uh, they, if you were active, uh, an activist uh, in the civil rights movement in the, in the deep south, all the people c considered you to be a freedom rider and that's what you call it. So it became a tag on you. Um, the other thing is, is that what's really uh, uh, we need to understand, I think, at this part is with the young people, they gave us as a sort of inroads into the civil rights movement to a large extent and a place and a role to be played in terms of we, with, with the sit-ins and, um, and the freedom rides and the direct action movement of, itself is. But to pay, this whole thing had been paid by the elders. I mean, the NAACP had been, uh, had a, a movement going on in these backwoods and communities for ages. I mean, to, to have a NAACP card at that time, that was revolutionary. And so a lot of the people who, as we began to move and throughout the doing border registration work with others in the backwoods and the communities, with the sharecroppers and others, that was the footprint of the NAACP and the elders. And a movement had already been in place that we became a part of. So they were able to take us in, they fed us, the people did this and took care of us because there was an underground type of a movement uh, in, the, uh, in the deep south all the time. Is, and we would, became a part of that and was helped to, to uh, put a, a different type of a flow in a direction to it. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think that what history tries to show that most of this was because of just the work of, of SNCC and CORE and the young people. I mean, we could not have done what we did had not been for those people who, never, who do not get any credit uh, for this particular work is and for what, the, uh, uh, what they did to put the floor beneath our work is. And um, uh, so I just want to put that out there. So, so Mr. Person, when, when you left Washington 59 years ago, did you ever anticipate that what you were doing would be in the history books? Then we had no expectation that it would have that kind of impact. We just knew that, that it had to be something better. Uh, and I think after we began to bond and realized we were friendships, that was the first time I'd had white friends and vice versa. Uh, I was reading certain books at that time, which was prevalent in the, in the black universities, and they were reading a lot of the existentialists, and, and we began to share stuff. And we realized that there was a lot of things we had in common and then we were all missing out because we we're not able to share these kind of relationships or friendships but as far as the outcome or, or what it was the impact was going to have on the nation we didn't think that far ahead we was just it was there for the moment and we knew that what we knew that was bad so there had to be something that was better and we were working for whatever there was that was better okay and joan browning in looking at your your correspondence which you have saved and is now archived at emory you told you, I think it was your friend Faye, to make sure you save newspaper clippings and other items. And seemingly as a young woman in 1961, you had some, some glimpse that maybe one day some student or some researcher may come along to chronicle this. Was that the case? I thought that um, I had finally severed every connection to the future and previous ambitions I had to join the space program as a mathematician. <laughs> you know, I thought I had stepped across the color line and I did not know what was going to be over there. And I thought someday I might want to write my memoirs and I'd need these Dear Fay letters and the newspaper clippings and whatnot. But I was mostly being sarcastic because honestly, I didn't think we were going to live to be old people. I, I, uh, I was uh, kind of surprised that, uh, that, that we, many of us lived through it because there were serious efforts and there was serious hostility to what we were doing. 
uh, that could have been uh, fatal to us. So no, I I uh, I had no. I, I, I knew I was doing what I needed to do, and uh, I was with people I trusted implicitly, and uh, they were making all the decisions, and I was confident in that. But I had no sense that, that we were doing anything historic. So just for those who are listening, you said you as a young young college student, you, you never thought you would live to an old age. And, and, and Dave Dennis said as much that those who signed up for the Freedom Rise thought they were signing up for a suicide mission. Um, to use his words. Uh, so that shows you the, the real gravity of, of this, this critical moment uh, in American history. There are a lot of uh, people who join in today with questions and, and comments. So I will turn uh, to our program manager, Jennifer Melton, to see uh, what comments there may be or questions there may be for those who joined us via Zoom and our, our Facebook Live broadcast. So Jennifer? Yes. Uh, we have one question, uh, or a few questions, and I'll just remind you, if you have questions uh, uh, tonight, you can feel free to add them to the Q&A box on Zoom or uh, as a comment on Facebook. Um, so the first question we have is from June Jeffries on Zoom uh, for Joan. If you can talk about your family and friends' reaction to your involvement. Well, uh, for my mother had divorced my father and married a, a, a man who, when I went to jail, said that in lover cannot come in my house. And so I was not able to go home for many years. And as a result, I was uh, uh, essentially cut off from my younger brothers and sisters. My mother would come and visit me in Atlanta. And so she always thought that uh, it, somebody's daughter needed to do what I was doing, but she wished it was somebody else's daughter. But when I decided to write about myself, I, I, uh, I studied oral history and learned how to do that. And I made appointments with my brothers and sisters and, and went down and interviewed them. My brother Wayne said that mother called him and said, Joan's in jail in Albany, what should I do? And he said, she's where she wants to be, just leave her there. <clears throat> but she didn't. One of my dear Faye letters says, Mother is downstairs, but the police won't let her see me. And she died not too long after that. And I never got to ask her what she thought she was doing. I mean, I, she obviously had no idea what you do when your daughter's in jail as a freedom rider, but she was there to do whatever mother could do. Uh, so I have uh, it really uh, not had a very good relationship with my family since then, but, I have, uh, you know, there's an old country song that says, if you can't be with the ones you love, love the ones you're with. And I fell in with a wonderful group of people who've been my lifelong family, including Charles and Dave and, you know, wonderful, wonderful people. Jennifer, let, let's, uh, let's ask uh, Mr. Person and Mr. Dennis that question too. So here you are now, photographs are circulating, you're in the newspaper. What, what was the response of the Person family in Atlanta uh, and, and the Dennis family in Louisiana to what they were seeing happening to, to a member of their family? Well, the men in the family were okay, but I've, I've learned that the, the women in the family really were really torn apart. Um, and mainly because I didn't quite level with them. I didn't tell them the whole truth when I went to join the Freedom Rods. I told them I was going to DC for advanced training, which was true. I didn't tell them of the potential dangers of coming back south. So uh, on May 13th, before we, what happened in Anderson, I did finally get my mother's permission. And I'm glad I did because had I not gotten permission and after what happened, I don't know what would have happened. Um, I, I tell you that um, I guess the highlight of my career before my mother died a couple of years ago is um, she, we were, on, we were on a road trip to go visit my brother who was a Vietnam veteran who was dying from uh, exposure to Asian Orange. And we were at one of the rest stops and she says, I'm glad you did what you did. And I said, mom, what do you mean? She said, well, I remember back when we used to do these trips and you know, we had to pack our own lunches and we had to have beverages with us. But she says the hard part about making those trips was not so much the food, she said, but when we had to go to the, to use the restroom, for the boys, it was rather simple. They just go out into the woods. But for the girls, they had to squat down between the doors of the car to relieve themselves. 
And I think back today how embarrassing that must have been, but that was the only way they could do that if you made a long road trip because they couldn't, we couldn't use the restroom in the gas stations or any of the restaurants along the way. So that in, in essence, mom had, I guess, finally forgiven me for what I had done because she realized that she could not in her last days see the benefits of those that, that ride through the South in the 1960s. Mr. Dennis, what was the reaction to, to your family? Yeah, my, my family never said anything negative to me about my involvement in the movement, which is very interesting, strangers, because they came out of farmers and people like that. The fact is, is that uh, my mom went to all the meetings with me and stuff in Shreveport when I went back home. Uh, my first time I was arrested, when I was arrested, and uh, she, she didn't know about my arrest in New Orleans for uh, much later. And how she found out I was arrested in Mississippi uh, from the Freedom Rides was that my mom was a beautician, and so a lady came in and said, uh, the, her name was Kizzy. And it's, the story goes, it said, Miss Kizzy, Miss Kizzy, Sonny is in jail. And so my, my mama told him, stop lying on my son. My son's in school at Dillard University. <laughs> and so they, but they never did it. And so we, I mean, we very active. My grandmother was sort of active in her own way in the, in the community. And I've talked about this story about how she changed the whole community. I didn't understand. I learned some about uh, uh, organizing from her. But one of the things that really shocked me uh, was the, was after my mom died, I knew my mom had been around with these beauticians, but I didn't know what they were doing. So when I found out after my mother died, and which was uh, not too long ago, is that we're going through her stuff and everything else that I find out that she, she and these beauticians had a reputation around this and how I didn't know that, I have no idea. But they were out doing voter registration work, all the areas around Shreveport and places like that. They worked with Dr. Simpkins, he talked to me about it later after mom died and Reverend Blake and those people. And so what happened is that the, uh, they were back there and they carried pistols, they carried their guns. And one way is the other way I found out about it too was I was at a meeting in Atlanta and this lady came up to me and she said, Sonny, you miss kids this son, right? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, your mom or something else is. And she was telling about my mom and she said, they used to come down and get people registered to vote. My mom will work with us some too, is it? And those ladies, they carry with pistol pie, pie, uh, packing women, you know. <laughs> I didn't know anything about this stuff. Is all the time I was in the movement, so I, I knew my mom always carried a gun, but I never didn't know about these three women or what they did and the, and the work that they did. And they, they, uh, their beauty shop now has been turned in Shreveport has been turned into a museum. I mean, that's how well they were known to people. So they never did. Uh, no one ever. And so it really. In the community I grew up in, I came up in a community, I came from a single parent home and I came up, um, the first part was the plantation, then we moved to this little place called Cedar Grove, right outside of Shreveport. And so there, we, it was a community. We had, at that time is, black people had real communities, all right? We looked at the children who grew up, uh, at, it, that we grew up with, with, a, with a lot of parents, because we were children of the, of the community rather than, the children of any bi particular biological parents. So everybody knew what you did, everything. So when I came back from being part of the movement, I was like a little hero, you know I mean? People looked out for me, they uh, protected. I was out of town one time, is in the clan of, 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 of five of them, uh, my mom in the house, uh, run across in front of it. I heard about it and my mom, my mom said, don't worry about it. Say, uh, your friends and boys, they're all on, on the, on the, uh, around in the house here, you know, <laughs> on the floor. <laughs> don't worry about a thing. We got it covered here, you know? So it was like a community uh, which we don't have now. So like with the young people today, what they need is what we had. What we had were elders and other people really looked out for us and who gave us a whole lot of support that people don't understand. We got support from the churches. The movement in those days was a mixture of both middle class, you know, poor people. We had pro property owners. We had people who were on, on businesses because black people did own businesses at the time. We did have an economic base. There were ministers, there were young people, there were teachers. They were all involved in the movement per se. And so they gave us protection. What, we, what the young people need today is is we as elders need to come together and figure out a way to give them the kind of support that they need. We need to be able to create our own 
type of family, a family of love, but a family of support for these young people. They need us now just as we needed the people uh, that helped us and gave us support, put a floor beneath us. Is. So I think that we need to look at this in a very serious way because that's what is missing. We don't have the, uh, this country after the 1964 Civil Rights Act and 1965 Border Rights Act, this country intentionally set up a system to tear away, to take away the family structure of the black community, the economic structure of the black community, and put us in a situation where we are now. It's called urban renewal, whereby you have these uh, put expressways right straight through is, and, and I mean, uh, right through the business section. You look at New Orleans, you look at South Carolina, you look at uh, North Carolina, uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and other places, right where you had economic bases, they put the expressways right through there to kill the black community. They took away our own culture and people like that. First was the Moynihan Report that dug into the factors of our family structure. And one of the things we had was our strength was our extended family structure. So I don't get too far in that, but mm -hmm. at any rate is what the kids don't have today is what we had then is we need to give it back to them and build it back to them. Okay. Other have, questions from the audience? Yeah, that actually touches on a, a few different versions of this question. So I'm gonna combine a few questions that I'm getting. Um, from, uh, let's see, I just lost my name, from Toby Baker, Todd Allen, and Rebecca Turnmeyer, all versions of this question, which is how we, we're seeing a lot of youth activism uh, today, especially this summer in light of uh, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and others. And so the question is, how do you see those movements related to your move, you know, your activism in the 60s? And then also, what advice do you have um, for activists today? So let's let's start start with Mr. Person. There's a lot of similarities between what we did and what uh, some of the things that they're doing. Uh, one of the things that uh, we did initially was we uh, wrote a manifesto that outlined what we wanted and how we were going to do it. Therefore, the community knew why we were protesting and, and uh, how we were going to protest. Um, one of the things we never uh, protested at night because we knew that it, under the cover of darkness, uh, anybody could infiltrate your movement and do things that are not along with your agenda. Uh, we also, we knew we had a dress code. Uh, the boys wore shirt and ties and the girls wore their Sunday best. And this way we could distinguish our folk from other folks. Um, another thing that, uh, oh, also, um, we had a, a, a mechanism where we could communicate like when the, the, the Freedom Riders were trapped in the church in uh, Montgomery, uh, Reverend Abernathy, Martin Luther King, they had the, the phone numbers to get talk to the Kennedys and other people in the government. Uh, nowadays, you have no communication between uh, the people in the street and the local governments. And the only way they're gonna have, the reason we haven't had any success after Trayvon and all the others, Mr. Gardner and so forth, is because we kept the, the movement in the street and we didn't move the, the movement into the boardrooms and the executive suites of the governor's and the mayor's offices because you gotta start talking about these things with people who can make decisions. You know, you just don't get marching just for the sake of marching. You have to have a reason you're marching, but also it has to come a time when you need to sit down and talk with people uh, about your grievances. And if they don't agree with your grievances, then you pick at them then you boycott them. And the same bodies you use to march up and down the street, now these are people that you can use to, to provide your pickets. So there's a lot of similarities and I think what has to happen though is we've got to move those demonstrations, not keep them in the street. We've got to move them as we have a situation where you talk uh, to the people in power, to the people who make decisions to force them or at least encourage them. You have to have compromise because you're not gonna have everything you want and you're not gonna allow them to have everything they want. But this is a time for change, and the change is due now. So, so Joan Browning, how would you respond to that question? One of the great uh, treasures I found in the movement was Miss Ella Baker. And I had the privilege of being there when there weren't a whole lot of us, and I got to spend a good bit of time with her. Miss Baker said that the people who hurt the most are your leaders. The people who hurt the most are the ones who set the agenda. And there's a talk these days that I hear about how white people can be an ally. And it's just very simple for me. The people who hurt the most set the agenda. 
And I agree with absolutely every word that Charles just said. You know, we didn't march at night because the night covers too many things that, that uh, are detrimental to us. Uh, but we also were organized. We didn't just put out a, a Facebook notice saying, everybody bring a sign at you know, such and such a location at such and such a time. We got together and as I mentioned, uh, nonviolence was our moral authority. That's, that was the only real weapon we had. We could put our bodies in a certain place non, and be nonviolent. And, and uh, it, that, that, was, that, was, that was the whole arsenal. Mm -hmm. So we had to be trained in nonviolence. We had to agree to not react when people uh, spat on us and, and did all the things that they did. And we talked, we, we were a group. We knew each other. We talked about these things hours and hours and hours on end until we were bonded and we were committed to each other. And uh, people talk about veterans of the civil rights movement. And that is, I think that's a good analogy because we were all in the same foxhole and we would look after everybody and uh, just like the marines you know uh, charles says nobody got left behind and you knew you weren't going to be left behind no matter what so um but but uh, i urge people read about ella baker she was a very complex woman she was really in, in the, the after other than my mother the most influential person in my whole life and uh, and she said, and again, I'll repeat, she said, the people who hurt the most are the leaders. They're the people who define what success will be. Mm -hmm. well, uh, Mr. Dennis, in, in that 1965 personnel file for CORE, there's a line in the application that says, how long will you be involved in the civil rights movement? And you respond, as long as I live in the South. Today, you're living in South Carolina. You, you're, you're not a veteran, you're still active uh, in the struggle. So how would you respond to this question about how your work 60 years ago connects to what is going on today in America? Yeah, I think that uh, as Bob Moses always talk about, we're now in what we call a surge back. Uh, we've had our surge forward in the 60s and other times and every 50 or so years in this country, there's a surge forward and a surge back. And part of this surge back is, has to do with our fault to a large extent is because we did not organize and we, you know, um, of the people, we did not organize our communities and we didn't hold on to our communities. So one of the things is, is that there are two avenues to freedom that black people have always dealt with from uh, the statement until the present day is. One is education and the other one happens to be the, uh, the right to vote. And voting rights, I mean, the right to organize, get into the political scheme is really key. So one of the things is I learned, we learned in, in the civil rights movement days is, it had a lot to do with people like uh, Dr. Simpkins, uh, Jim McCain, uh, people like that is, and, and that is to talk about if you want some real action in this country, and you want to talk about what power really is, is deal with the politics of this country, deal with the pocketbooks of this country. And so he was absolutely correct. So back in the 60s, 61, 62, one thing that impressed me was also what Bob Mosen was doing uh, and SNCC were doing in, in uh, Mississippi. And so the idea here is how do you, uh, you have to choose your battles very carefully because you can't spread yourself out too thin Vin. because you're not gonna be as effective. So what is it that you can do that has the greatest impact and use your energies because we have very few resources to work with. And so what we had to do in the sixes is we had to make that choice. So a group of us is in core and SNCC decide that the sit-ins were okay, uh, you know, people can do that, but that is not where the heart was, where we had to deal with some of the economic development and the other, other piece had to do with education, but more important than that is we got to get into the politics of this country. We have to go to where the power was. And so when we did the free uh, the Mississippi pieces, that was our primary focus, except for one of those short period of time which in a sense is caused Mecca Evans to lose his life is, um, uh, and that's around the sit-ins of movement. But we, we stuck to the fact is of, of attacking this country and this political structure and going to the heart of it. And I think today is, is where it is. I mean, that's where we are again, is both in education and also in terms of economic development, which is both those are tied together is, but more important than the politics of this country is. And, and, uh, and be a tie into it because we need to deal with the power structures. In 1964, 
that was proved. A little group of people, black people out of the Mississippi is with the Freedom Democratic Party, almost brought this country to its knees. The president of the United States, the unions and everybody else, they had all of that power had to come together. They could no longer say that it was just a group of people in the South uh, that was causing problems is like the Ku Klux Klan and stuff like this is that other people are so good. We went up against the power structure and the power structure said, okay, you can't come in yet, you know? And so that's where we are now. So my, my suggestion is what I'm talking about here is what we need to begin to think about and concentrate on how do we be more selective in what we do and how do we go after the power structure? Because if we don't do that, I mean, we don't, everything else to me is doesn't make much sense. And so what young people need to do, what they're doing is, is that they think uh, going after the power structure pieces. Right now is going out to get uh, to vote. Number two is we need to be very careful. How do we get people out to vote is? Because it's a do or die situation, as far as I'm concerned, is in this country for black people and people of color. So we have to begin to focus on this. But after November the 3rd, regardless of what the turnout be, if we do win, uh, if you want to call it winning, if we do able to do something, we don't stop there. We need to figure out how to really begin to organize and commit ourselves to uh, the long haul of rebuilding our communities, rebuilding our education system where it affects us, our HBCUs and others. And we need to really begin to work together to, to build the kind of relationship that's going to be necessary for us to make the changes that's going to be permanent for ourselves and for our children. Well, thank you uh, very much. We have a few more minutes before we conclude. And as a sort of set the stage for our, our final commentary, uh, Mr. Person, 59 years ago, you came through Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, there were multiple photographs taken of you uh, that were never printed uh, in the newspapers. And so most people never knew there was a freedom rider in Columbia. Uh, I want to uh, end tonight with a quote from Dr. King that he gave in 1964 when he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize. He said, most people in the movement will never make the headline and their names will never appear in who's who. Yet when years of roles pass and when the blazing light of truth is focused on this marvelous age in which we live, men and women will know and children will be taught that our nation is better because of those nameless people who were willing to suffer for righteousness sake. So each of you have talked about, you, mean, you understand and recognize your critical role in this movement, but each of you are mindful of the countless people who were directly involved in the movement, who have never made the news, who have never been the focus of a history, who are not a part of a, a Zoom webinar. So, so as we conclude, I would like for each of you to talk about that larger history of the movement that has never been fully recorded about those who enabled you uh, to be who you are today. So Mr. Person, we'll begin with you uh, and reflect back on that ride you took through Columbia in May of 1961. Those memories, uh, to, to relive them uh, has been great because I remember uh, as a young kid, the first time I had left the South, I left the state of Georgia, and people uh, provided lodging for us. Uh, they provided meals for us. And many of them gave us the best that they have and they weren't wealthy people. Uh, it, and, and I had helped that I could have reached out to them after the rides and thanked them for the things that they offered us and gave for us. But my uh, diary was lost the day that um, I was beaten in Birmingham and I lost my coat and in that coat was my diary. And these people, like I say, uh, they uh, provided services that we couldn't get from the larger society. Likewise, while we were in jail, the students, uh, our classmates got our assignments to us so that uh, we, would, we wouldn't be behind. Uh, there, there were just so many things that people who were not able to march and sit in, they made signs, some made sandwiches. And there were a lot of little things. It was a truly a grassroots organization because everyone could do something, regardless of how small it may seem, it all became a part of this quilt that made us successful. And any success that we obtain, it, we owe it to them because we were not been able to do those things had they not been there. And I'm, I always will be indebted to the folks that I met along the way. 
and I may not know your name, but wherever you are, let it be known that I, I love you and I thank you for all that you did because without you, we would not have been able to be successful. Well, thank you. Uh, John Browning. When I was in jail in Albany, when we were in jail in Albany, my friend Connie Curry was sort of a chauffeur for Ella Baker. And she drove Ella to Albany and they were stationed in one of the churches. And as those thousand people came out of jail, they would be there saying, uh, what do you need? Uh, do you need a ride home? Do you need, because they would come from the jail to the church. Uh, do you need to help with your homework? What do you need? So they, there were people like that who were always supporting us. There was another woman who came. She was a run, ran a thing called the Georgia Council on Human Relations. And she came to Albany and her, her mission was to try to mediate, try to find some white allies in Albany uh, for the Albany movement. Miss Frances Pauley was very important. And then the, the Harris family and Bernice Johnson and uh, people our age who were natives of Albany who were in the movement, sometimes in jail, sometimes out, were there helping us. I fell in love with Charlie Sherrard, who's still in Albany to this day. You know, he, he went there uh, in, in 1961 and he's still there, still doing whatever he can to improve Albany. Uh, there was a whole network of people. And when uh, the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rods uh, came, came about and we got invited to go speak to people, every time I would be at a, with other Freedom Riders and do a presentation, sometimes toward the end, way you in the back of the room, somebody would stand up and say something like, I was just 12 years old in Cleveland, but we baked cookies and made lemonade and we sold these in front of my house and raised money for the Freedom Riders. You know, there are people like Dr. King says that we'll never know who were part of this whole uh, network that was holding us up. So while we might have gotten our names in the paper and our pictures in, in the history books, I want to give a shout out to everybody who supported us and there are tens of thousands of them. Okay, so Dave Bennett will leave the final word for you. Uh, next year is the sixth anniversary of the Freedom Ride. So did you look back now and think about your own role and the role of those who, who, who were behind the scenes? What are your final thoughts uh, for this evening? Yeah, I think that I'm glad you raised that question. I've sort of mentioned a few names earlier, but as, as John was saying is in charge, is that there were, there were hundreds and thousands. We brought in a thousand people, young people in 1964 into Mississippi. And we brought in several hundred people throughout Louisiana and Alabama during those summers. And so all those people had to be housed. All those people had to be fed. And it was the local community people who did that. And what you have to understand is, is that they did that with the understanding that, that they were being watched, that the white, the clans and others knew that that's what they were doing. They also knew that they were gonna be housing these people for a short period of time is, and when the summer was over that period of time, they were gonna leave and they're gonna be there by themselves. So when you talk about all of those people, uh, what haunts me in the movement today is, I mean, what haunts me about the movement today is, uh, I, I was around people who died, you know, I was with Megan an hour before he was assassinated. I was with Cheney Goodman Swerner 24 hours before they were assassinated. You know, we lost over about 19 people during the time <coughs> I was in the movement in Mississippi during that period of time, 19, not nine, not eight. So one of the things that stands out as an example of what I'm talking about is, we used to have what it called uh, uh, voting, uh, freedom vote days uh, in Mississippi and in Louisiana. And so that would be a day we bring in, you know, hundreds of people, as many people we possibly can to go to, try to register to vote. No they would not be able to, but we do that in order to do, show the country is that it wasn't because of the, uh, uh, apathy that blacks weren't registered because they had all these other problems they had. So this was Canton, Mississippi. And we, I was sitting there is, and I, there was this, uh, I could hear this clip of the clock, clip of the clock. And I turned around and there was this mule uh, drawing a wagon with two old people, elderly people in there, two elderly black people. In there. The man was dressed, he had a hat on, he had his overalls, white shirt, and a dog tie. His wife had a bonnet on her head and tied with around the neck 
in a long dress suit. He drove up, he came up to his wagon right where you'd park cars at, and he got out of his wagon, he helped his, which was his wife, we found out, off of the wagon. And he did, walked over to us, he tipped his hat, and he says, where do I vote for George Raymond? George Raymond was one of our field secretaries. And we told him, well, George isn't running for office, Bob. This is where you go to register to vote. He say, and then can I vote for George Raymond? I said, yes. And so he said, okay. So he walks up the stairs, and I'll never forget when he walked up those stairs, in one of these old courthouses, on each side with the sheriff, Billy Noble, and all those over there watching him, they, were, they knew who he was. He held his head up high. <clears throat> he walked in and he walked out. When he came back down, <clears throat> he tipped his hat and said, thank you. And he helped his wife in, on the wagon, and he got in the wagon. And clippity clock, they went disappeared. I don't know what happened to them. I have no idea what happened to them. And that haunts me all the time because I'm in a war. We went to freedom schools. We went to the churches or rallies and had to go back out into those woods. And when we left and when the freedom summer was over, those people were there unprotected because the government left, the press left, Everybody left, but they had to stay there. You know, we don't know how many people, what happened to them who were involved in the movement. We do know how much support they gave and their involvement, how important it was for their involvement. And so, so yes, we all need to t take a pause when we think about Dr. King and when we think about Mega Evers and we think about Cheney Goodman Swerner and others, you know, we need to also think about all the others who died that we don't know anything about is or what happened to them uh, who part of the civil rights movement, who made it possible for people to be able to do what they're doing now. So to not to go to the register and vote and to vote in this election is, it's very, it's really like, you know, doing really bad things to those particular, in that memory, you know? So we should do it for another reasons, is for the memory of those people who, who made those sacrifices so that we could be who we are today. Well, Ms. Dennis, that is an appropriate benediction uh, for tonight, that we pause and think about the extraordinary paths that have been blazed and the foundation established. Uh, this will conclude our program for tonight. I'm especially grateful to each of you who've joined us uh, this evening for this historic reunion of Freedom Riders. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the College of Arts and Sciences, our Columbia SC 63 Our Story Matters, the entire staff of the Center for Civil Rights History and Research, Jennifer Melton, Latasha Saunders, and our team, but especially David Dennis, Joan Browning, and Charles Persons. Thank each of you uh, today for your activism and your advocacy and for your extraordinary example, both then and now. Thank you and good evening.